<laughs> okay, welcome everybody to another edition of the GWJDD uh, Dermatology Translational Science Lecture Series. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Allergan, Bayer, and Ben, for affording us this opportunity to bring a world-class physician scientist, Dr. Diane Tivitao, who is an endowed professor of dermatology at Penn State. Uh, physician scientist, I think that term is thrown around a lot, but she is the quintessential physician scientist, uh, really jumping from clinic, a very busy active clinical practice in acne and rosacea, and then back to the lab uh, with her research really focusing on the SIVA site, uh, hormonal influences on the skin, uh, research on toll-like receptors, the whole gamut of, of acne rosacea research. She's published extensively, numerous awards, NIH funding, so we're really fortunate to have her here with us today to, of course, talk with us about acne. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Adam, for having me. I'm just going to share with you a little bit of a, a little bit of a history lesson, a uh, history of uh, isotretinoin and things that we use commonly in acne. Dr. Nelson asked me just to give you a little insight into how I got involved in research. I initially started off uh, in school at pharmacy uh, in Boston, and I did a research project, and I really liked it. And then I decided um, to go into research, and I took a job based following my husband around the country back in the dark ages. Um, I took a job in the pharmaceutical industry, and I worked in the pharmaceutical industry doing uh, evaluation of medical devices in their preclinical department. And as part of that, it was actually kind of fun. I was part of the team. So I did all the testing of the hemodialyzers, the membrane oxygenators, the plasmapheresis devices. And we would meet with these teams where there would be people from, uh, from the research, there would be people from marketing, there would be the medical director who was running clinical trials. So it was all phases of the research project from the bench to the animal studies to the clinical trials to the practice that met in these team meetings. And then as a research tech at that point, I said, I think I want to be that guy. I want to be that medical director guy, the guy who's running those clinical trials and running this whole team. So then I decided to go to medical school so that I could work towards that goal of going back to the pharmaceutical industry and being a medical director and running a team. I never left. <laughs> so I went to medical school at Penn State uh, a million years ago, and I have never left. So I went to school there, did my residency there. Uh, as a resident in dermatology, I was afforded just a, a half a day a week that I could have spend some time in the endocrinology lab. I did some work there, got a little grant from the Germ Foundation. I enjoyed that work. I was able then, when I finished my residency, to do a fellowship. Um, at Penn State with fund, uh, funding from the Derm Foundation, then went on to a career development award, uh, and then to an NIH K08, and then an R01. So focusing on my biggest interest is in acne, and trying to figure out what's controlling the sebaceous gland, because I think as clinicians we all know that trying to suppress sebum is really challenging for our patients with acne. So as a resident, I became really intrigued with isotretinoin, seeing how powerful it was, you know, it had been around since the late 70s, early 80s, um, and to this day, there still isn't any really substitute for that sort of gold standard of acne treatment. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. So I'm talking about translational research today, and there's different components of translational research. There's different phases. There's the, the bench, um, where we go from the bench into humans, that's T1. Then you go into uh, clinical settings, then into practice, where you, you know, incorporate the drug into your practice, and then looking at how the drug behaves in populations and database analysis. So there's all different phases. There's also a phase that um, I'm kind of talking about here, where things have been in practice, things have been tried in large populations, but there's still a lot that we don't know about them, like isotretinoin being a perfect example. It's been around for a while. We still don't know exactly what it's doing, and my thought is, is that if we knew what it was doing, we might find better ways to have alternative drugs that would be safer that would do the same thing. So my research would be, I guess, term T5, which is from the population back to the bench. So that I'm going to do two case studies um, looking at the different types of translational research. So the first, in which I'm going to talk about mostly, is expanding our insights into the mechanism of action of isotretinoin. So this is really bedside to bench. So isotretinoin is a clinical use, and we're sort of going back to the bench and trying to figure out what exactly is it doing, how can we find other drugs that do the same thing. 
The second example, which is really a small, short example at the end, and I hope we have time to get to it, is the more um, classic bench to bench side where compounds are developed, they go through preclinical testing, they go into animal studies, they then go into humans. So I have an example of um, some work from our laboratory of a drug that started off in preclinical that has, is now in clinical trials that's aimed at this <coughs> SIBO production. So the story of isotretinoin, um, we, many of us, we all, oh, it projects better on the plasma screen than anything. Um, we all know the story. It, it's an amazing drug. It does a great job for people. Um, why don't we have alternative drugs that do the same thing? And what exactly is it doing? So we have case after case where the, the isotretinoin has really changed the lives of many of the patients that we treat. So I'm giving you a little history lesson because many of you are a whole lot younger than me and might not be aware of uh, how we learned about isotretinoin to begin with. It wasn't the classic model of let's find a drug to cure acne. It was sort of like, oh, here's a, um, and this was work done at the NIH by Dr. Uh, Gregory Pack and others. Uh, a study that came before this was they were actually using isotretinoin in children with disorders of keratinization. And they noticed that a subset of those kids that had very bad acne got better. So that led that observation led to the use of isotretinoin in some early clinical trials. And this is uh, one of the first ones published in the New England Journal back in 1979, looking at prolonged remission of acne in patients that were treated with this. So this is the abstract from the study. It was four, well, just 14 patients with treatment-resistant acne were treated for four months. They used two milligrams per kilo in this particular study, and they noticed that 13 patients were completely clear, other patients had 75% improvement. Prolonged remissions lasting as long as 20 months after discontinuation were noticed in 14 of the patients. They talked a little bit about some of the side effects. And what they say at the end is the mechanism of action of 13 cis retinoic acid is probably uh, involves a direct inhibitory effect on the sebaceous gland. So they were just sort of postulating what it might do. So this led to another study um, that this is a study, a placebo control study, that was um, done for people with severe acne and looking at the drug. Again, very small numbers of patients. So I just give you a little interesting aside. Years ago, we were doing um, an evidence-based uh, analysis, a systematic review of the literature regarding um, drug and drug acne treatments, and uh, isotretinoin did not make it to the list of effective treatments for acne, which was very surprising. Can anybody guess why? It's sufficient numbers, right? Because it was so powerful, the clinical trials that were that were done years ago, um, nearly everyone got better. So they were done in amazingly small numbers of patients. Because of that, that those studies don't meet the criteria for labeling it as good evidence. So there was some suggestion based on this systematic review that topical tea tree oil was as good as isotretinoin for the treatment of acne. And that's when all the experts in the room raised their hands and said, wait a sec, something is wrong with this picture. So, um, but the drug is very, very powerful. So it was done in small numbers of patients. And I, I think all of us will agree that it is highly effective in the treatment of acne. So uh, in this study that was um, that was placebo controlled again, excellent results. And, but here they did some skin biopsies and they did quantitative measurement of sebum production, and they found inhibition of sebaceous gland size and function that might re that might relate to the mechanism of action of isotretinoin. So this was done back in 1982. <laughs> so from that time, you know, and the, the drug's been in use and. Until I started my work um, in the late, in the, well, early 90s, I guess late 80s, early 90s, um, I really wanted to revisit this question, like how is the sebaceous gland being affected and what's happening? So this, these are some of the, the histology from that early study that I just told you about. So you can see here, this is a, a normal follicle with multilobulated sebaceous glands, looks pretty big. And um, what they did in the study was 16 weeks after patients had been on isotretinoin, they did skin biopsies again. And here's the follicle. And you can see that there's really just sort of remnants of the sebaceous gland. It's not this multi-lobulated big gland with lots of lipid. It's kind of small. 
And if you did a cross section, you'd see that there aren't these big lip and laden lobules. So obviously it is doing something to the sebaceous gland, but how is it doing that? And so that's what I wanted to figure out. One of the challenges with acne though is there's no mice or rats or any animal running around with acne, which is problematic. So we lack some good um, animal models for examining acne. So we have surrogate models that can examine certain components of the acne pathogenesis. We look at uh, we can look at human sebaceous glands that have been dissected from like skin left over from low surgery. We've made uh, primary human sebocytes can be grown in culture, but they're really hard to grow in culture because they like to make lipid and differentiate and rupture. So we can't keep them going in culture for a long time. So what uh, what we had done, we developed a SEM1 cell line, and there's another uh, SD95 cell line that took human sebocytes and immortalized them with um, with the SV40 large T antigen to make those cell lines proliferate in culture, which they do. So they proliferate in culture, we can study them. The downside is that they don't make as much lipid as the primary sebocytes. We can also look at keratinocytes, and our best animal model is humans for the study of action. So what we wanted to do is backtrack and try to look at what's causing this dramatic change in the sebaceous gland. If we knew how it was happening, we might be able to find another way to do it. So the hypothesis was that the change in the size, shape, and lipid content um, was uh, due to uh, apoptosis occurring within the sebaceous gland or cell cycle arrest. So that's what we set out to do. So we used a variety of cell lines and a variety of assays basically trying to test if apoptosis was occurring from uh, isotretinoin or if cell cycle arrest was occurring as a result of uh, isotretinoin. And this is the tritiated thymidine. I'm not going to take you through the whole thing, but basically tritiated thymidine measures DNA synthesis. So if your DNA synthesis goes down, you're having a slower cell proliferation. And these are the different concentrations of 13 cis retinoic acid, and you can see that it's inhibiting cell, cell proliferation. Cyclin D um, is also an, another way uh, to measure cell cycle progression. And so we did a Western blot analysis for cyclin D, and it decreased with 13 cis retinoic acid. So it's clear that isotretinoin is, is decreasing uh, cell cycle progression and cell, cellular proliferation. This is an assay, a fax assay, looking um, at an XMB5 for apoptosis. And what's interesting about this is we took, we took isotretinoin, we took 9 cis retinoic acid, and all trans retinoic acid. And we used different concentrations, you can see over here. And the, the cells that are positive are indi indicative of apoptosis. And you can see that the apoptosis just occurred with 13 cis retinoic acid, and not with 9 cis, and not with all trans. So this effect on the sebaceous gland is, is specific for 13 cis retinoic acid. And I guess that would explain why this drug decreases sebum production and the others don't. So back uh, when we were doing a lot of this research, that's when the first gene chips came out where you could do large scale um, gene array expression analysis. So we were very fortunate to get uh, one of the Affymetric systems that could do gene, gene array expression back when it first started. And again, we still were trying to answer the question of what is isotretinoin doing to human skin? 